scooter. Ooh, fancy. Okay, and I am also, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. All right, hi everybody. Um, my name is Amanda Petrick Gardner. I am a therapist in Kansas, licensed in multiple states though. And I am in charge of module five, OCD is 100% in the imagination. So let me pull up my PowerPoint and I will post the PowerPoint to the group later in case you're interested. It's nothing fancy though. So everybody can see that okay? So we let's make it bigger. Okay. That's so everything from this little PowerPoint is from our new Bible. I didn't make this stuff up. I am not an expert in this. If you're here and don't have it yet, I feel like you should, but I'm not sponsoring it. I'm not, don't get me in trouble for trying to advertise. Um, everything comes from the book. So one of the key components, I believe module five is helping our clients understand perception versus imagination. I was actually out to lunch with my husband, who's also a therapist, and I've been trying to teach him module by module just to practice um, while he's a therapist. He doesn't do this line of work. So I was explaining perception. Again, what we perceive, what we know to be true based on our senses. And so at the time we were at dinner having chips and salsa. So I asked him, how do you know that you are eating chips right now? And of course he looks at me like I'm an idiot because he's like, they're in my hand. And I'm like, okay, so they're in your hand. How do you know they're in your hand? He's like, well, I can feel it in my hand, Amanda. I can see the chip. I, and as he bites it, I can taste it. I can hear the crunch. And I'm like, that's exactly it. You just described what is happening in this moment through your senses to know this to be true. You didn't use stories of like, well, I've come here before and I've had chips or I like to eat chips. So I'm most likely going to order it or, you know, using things that are outside of the context, meaning right now. So then I asked him like, okay, now instead of this story based on perception that you're eating chips, you know, use your imagination and just make up a story. And we made up just something so random, doesn't even make sense about how this chip all of a sudden turned into a brownie right there in our hands. And then it floated up into the sky, right? Kind of ridiculous, but just explaining like nobody else in this room saw this story occur. One, because we know we made it up, but because nobody else could have said like, yes, we saw it happen. We heard it, we felt it. So imagination is again, what we generate, whether it's a story, it's an idea, it's a thought, not based on this moment in the here and now, not based on our senses. So this is a key point, first to make sure our clients understand that difference between perception and imagination. Why is it going backwards? There we go. Okay, so then we tie this to normal doubt and obsessional doubt. And just for Carl, I put in there normal uncertainty because I didn't know what, how we're referring to it and I wasn't gonna get on, <laughs> is it doubt or uncertainty? But normal doubt, um, it is that doubt in which there is actually direct evidence in the here and now. Again, we're using our perception and our senses to say, this is what is occurring or is not occurring. And they tend to get, normal doubt tends to get resolved pretty quickly. So I use the example, let's say you have two totally different clients and their doubt is, is this plate contaminated, still contaminated when it gets out of the dishwasher, right? So person A opens up their dishwasher and you'll see the picture on the left under normal doubt and is like, is this plate still dirty after I pull it out of a clean dishwasher? Most of us sitting here would be able to look at it and say, yes, that is dirty. There is still food crusted on there. I'm not gonna eat off of that. I'm going to scrub it or most likely if you're me, I'm just gonna put it back in the dishwasher two or three times and hope it gets fixed um, or we're gonna get grab a new plate. So normal doubt versus let's say person B who also has that same concern, that same doubt saying, you know, is this plate dirty when it comes out of a clean dishwasher? Well, you can see that picture on the right. Most people would use their senses in the here and now, this very moment, saying, nope, it looks fine. I don't see anything. However, that person B, maybe with obsessional doubt, creates this elaborate, very convincing story based in their imagination. It could include things like, well, it's possible. Or it could include these facts of like, well, germs are invisible. I might not be able to see it. Or it might include this hearsay of, well, I had a friend one time eat something off a plate in, from their clean dishwasher and then got sick, so it must have been contaminated. 
or they might use their personal experience saying it's happened to me before I had a, I thought it was a clean plate and then once I got up close there was something on it or I thought there was something on it it felt kind of weird so you can hear that this obsessional doubt in this story they have created about this clean plate that we can all see their senses actually has no direct evidence in the here and now so these are the questions that I will ask clients to just get to, again, help them understand how their obsessional doubt and obsessional story is completely based in their imagination. I'll ask them, you know, is there anything that you can perceive from your senses to tell you that this is occurring? Anything in this, you know, very moment. I will often even ask if they get kind of skewed. I will say, you know, if you're spouse was standing right here with you, or if your child was here with you, could they also see this? Could, do they also notice or hear or feel that this is occurring? Just again, to help bring them back to this very moment to find direct evidence right now. So this is, um, not to skip ahead, but module 10, I believe, is on the tricks and cheats of OCD. This is, you will eventually get to the, some of those little tricky spots where clients feel like there's direct evidence, but there's not really direct evidence. And it's our job to help them see why maybe some of those facts like, but there are germs and germs are invisible, helping them see maybe why that isn't such a direct evidence in the present moment. But one of my favorite ones, you'll hear it a million times is the, but it's possible and using that as evidence, but it is possible. My response is, well, yeah, everything is possible we're not trying to argue with our clients over whether something is possible or not. Because in fact, they're, they're actually probably right since so many things are possible. It probably is. However, even if there is a possibility, we cannot use this as a justification. We still have to bring it back to this moment and say, but is there any evidence that is like happening right now? So I use that example of like, but germs do exist. It is possible that that plate is dirty. Again, we're not arguing whether the plate really could be dirty or have germs or invisible germs on it. We are saying, but is there any direct, direct evidence right now that you know and you can see that it is dirty, okay? So this is like my little reminder, not only for this module, but I think I have been explaining to other therapists as well a million times saying, we are not challenging the thought, the content of the self. We are not trying to convince our client that like, no, it's not dirty. The dishwasher did a good enough job. You're just fine. We are just helping them recognize when a story is built in imagination versus when a story is built in reality and the here and now. So if we can help them understand that, then we'll be able to help them recognize that moment that they are getting pulled into that obsessional story when it is just so convincing and detailed that they are just what we say absorbed into that story instead of focusing on perception. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Is there a cat? I'll keep going. And one of the core components of um, ICBT in general, but um, partially in this module and continues through every, every module is helping our clients understand that difference between imagine and real possibility. Inferential confusion says that we sometimes mistake, imagine for real. So that is what we are helping our client resolve or better be able to recognize. And like I said, future modules will continue to address this, but if we can, we have that bridge metaphor. If we can help our clients understand when they are walking across the bridge to that OCD bubble, imagination land versus walking back over to the here and now, then they will never get sucked into all the obsessions and compulsions. So I have two stories, two examples that we can practice. Again, I didn't make these up. These are straight from the book. So a woman checks the front door five times when leaving to go to work and looks back several times to see if her cat has escaped. She also looks and fixates on the door when in her car for a I'm sorry, my screen is kind of blocked, so I can't even see the rest of that sentence. I'm going to bring up my book. Um, let's see, for a few minutes. The cat has escaped once before in the summer when she was gardening and left the back door open. However, has never escaped at the moment she leaves for work. So first, I'm going to ask, um, what is the doubt in the story? Anybody dying to answer? What's, what's her doubt here? 
probably all thinking it, but don't want to say it. Did the cat escape? There you go. So then we ask, do you believe, and anybody can answer, do you believe this doubt is obsessional? Right? If so, tell me what makes it obsessional, meaning built in the imagination. Or if you don't think it's obsessional, you feel like this is a real doubt, what makes it non obsessional? Anybody dare to throw out their thoughts? Can you go back to the story? I hmm. told yes, let's see if I'm, there we go. There's the story. So take a peek and what makes this either obsessional built in our imagination versus what makes it a real, real doubt based in the here and now. If it wasn't obsessional, she'd only check once. Correct, yeah. So I think it's an obsessional doubt. I agree. Anybody else agree with that? I'm going to assume the silence means, yes, we all believed it is obsessional. There's nothing in this exact moment that's saying, yep, the cat is escaping. Again, it does seem to have a whole lot of details that try to make it very convincing, but I still don't see anything in this present moment that's saying, oh yeah, this is occurring. So as I can't even see whoever popped up and said, yep, I believe it's obsessional, said like, yeah, if it's obsessional, then the comp and we can recognize that it's obsessional and we don't even get sucked into that story, then the compulsions won't even follow. We won't even feel the need to check a second or third or fourth time, right? Because when we're not stuck, sucked into this elaborate story, we don't even feel a need to entertain it. Does anybody have any other thoughts on this example? Can I just real quickly jump in just to clarify? So essentially we're saying, even though it seems like in there was saying that even though the cat did escape once in the summer, whenever before, so there was a direct experience of that, but that in this moment, once she locked and left, and even though she checked, you know, once, which would have been, let's say normative average, there was no need to do it any, any further kind of checking or looking back. Correct. And like I mentioned, chapter, ten, not chapter 10, but module 10, the tricks and cheats of OCD will go into this further in case, let's say you were the client and you were very insistent, but it has happened before. That's evidence that it could happen again. And I need yeah. to do this. That is a common trick of OCD where it's using our past experience saying, because it happened, it is happening again. And something we either call like maybe mismatching or out of context back saying, yeah, that might be fact. That event was fact. It did happen. But in the here and now, what evidence do you have that it's occurring today in this moment? So good question, because I'm no doubtly your clients will ask questions like that saying, but it has happened. So you're saying I shouldn't check a second and third and fourth time because it has occurred. We will, or whenever we get to module 10, we'll discuss why that isn't actually direct evidence because some of your clients might need a little bit more convincing. Right, exactly. And I'm also thinking, I think I touched on this once before uh, in one of the chats, like about real event OCD and stuff like that starts to come to mind, but thank you for clarifying. Correct. Yes, that's very, that pertains to real event OCD. Any other thoughts on the cat one? And then we'll do one more example. All right, example two, and I'm going to get read it from my book because my Zoom is blocking half the screen. A pharmacist recounts the number of pills when she gets distracted during her count. She believes the recounting is justified because it's important to be careful when it comes to people's health. Yet, she never has made any mistake with counting pills. However, she did once make a mistake in labeling the bottles. So I'm dying to hear people's thoughts on this because I've heard a few different reactions. Anybody want to guess, is this, what is the doubt, first of all? It's pretty easy. Did I make a mistake? Perfect, did I make a mistake counting the pills? Do you believe it's obsessional? If so, what makes it obsessional? Or who believes it's non-obsessional? Why? And we might have some different answers. I'll tell you my thoughts. Actually, when I, I was personally going- personally thought this was non-obsessional. It doesn't say that she recounted multiple times. Perfect. And I will jump in. And I actually, because uh, I kind of doubted myself if I was doing it right. First time I read through the book. And I actually asked the Facebook group saying, hey, what are the answers to these stories? Like, and somebody wrote in there, kind of confirmed my suspicions, but I felt it was non-obsessional because it literally says she was, or he was distracted. Mm. And so I say that is, again, 
using our senses in this moment, we know that to be true. I say, if there was a whole room full of people and we were to ask, you know, was somebody distracted? And they'd be like, yes, we heard somebody call the pharmacist's name or we saw something happen and they turned their head to look and they stopped counting. So to me, that's the direct evidence using our senses saying they really did get distracted and that person did stop counting. So to me, it seems normal doubt justified. They would, you know, and I don't, yeah, it doesn't even say they maybe recounted over and over, but to me, normal doubt versus what could we do to change this to an obsessional doubt? How could we make it based on imagination and not using direct evidence? And that could, I mean, that could say things like the pharmacist was counting, uh, <coughs> felt that they got to the number 100, but then afterwards they're like, was it really a hundred? What if I repeated a number several times? What if one fell on the floor and I didn't see it? What if a dog came in here and ate one up, right? Let's say we had in a story like that, then we would probably read that example and be like, well, that one sounds obsessional. None of this that we just saw or heard or read appears to be true. Now, isn't it possible that we counted one number twice? Like we said, 98 twice. It is possible. But as we mentioned, if we try to <laughs> address every possibility in the world, we wouldn't be able to even get out of bed because there'd be so many possibilities. So we're not trying to argue with them whether it is possible or not. We're saying, but in this moment, in this context, what do we know? So anyway, I kind of went on a tangent there saying we could turn the story more obsessional. But I should ask first, anybody else have thoughts on whether it's obsessional or non-obsessional? Is this an example of mismatching where she's taking an experience in the past, which was about mislabeling a prescription bottle and applying it to a situation where she's concerned she may have not counted the number of pills correctly? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I feel like the last half of the story almost includes some OCD tricks and cheats saying, oh, but I have made mistakes, be careful, right? So in those cases, like, okay, that one, that little part there is almost obsessional or in the imagination, but I'm kind of focusing on that first part, that very first session, not session, that very first sentence is saying, hey, this actually happened. They really did get distracted. And it doesn't say they stopped counting, but I'm guessing if you're distracted while you're counting, you stopped counting. So good question, because as I kept reading, I felt like, oh, this story is trying to like suck me into an imaginative story, but I still have to it seems like that's the basis for recounting. Yeah, she was distracted, but hey, I've, I've messed up before and I've mislabeled a bottle. So I better recount because um, if I made a mistake like that before, I'm going to do it here, even though I'm doing something different, counting pills. That's how I kind of interpret it. Yeah, but I, can e I, can, I can easily see the first part too. I was kind of thinking like, you know, pharmacists busy, they're, they're filled in all kinds of questions and Maybe someone asked them a question and and they spent and they were conversing with that person for a half minute or a minute, then came back and thought, well, maybe I I'm not I'm not really sure where I what left I off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I know that's a, that was to me the trickiest one in the book. Cause I'm like, I could see it going either way. <laughs> so again, I always bring it back to okay, would other people people be able to stand here and also say, yes, we saw this occur, right? We saw your head turn and you looked at something or you heard something, right? Now, while they would not be able to say for sure, like what the person's mental ability to keep counting through distraction would be, that's the part I kind of honed in on. But again, I, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer here or just getting the discussion going. So any other thoughts? Can I comment? Yes, please. <laughs> I think... <laughs> The key is, is to ask yourself here is, I agree, it's almost like missing information in this example. That's what makes it tricky. But the key to ask yourself here is like, uh, did she lose her count? Mm -hmm. Did she actually lose her count? That's, that's the fact that you need to know. If she actually lost the count, then yes, then it's based in the census, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, if she did not lose a count, uh, then there may be no justification for that doubt. Because we hear that often, right? With people who have, have doubts and they say, well, I got distracted. I, I'm not sure. But then you have to ask, well, did that distraction actually lead to you no longer being able to sense what you were supposed to sense, right? So that's the question to ask. So purely on the basis of this information here, uh, I would say it's, um, it's obsessional. If that's the only thing, yeah. Purely on this, uh, if if she uh, 
if she actually, uh, but it all depends on whether she actually lost count or not. So I think it's an interesting example in those terms to elaborate upon with, with a client uh, when you use this example, you know, when will it be fully obsessional and when not, you know, when is distraction a justification and when is distraction not a justification? Thank that's you. How, that's how I would uh, go with it. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, if this were my client, I'd probably elaborate, like, did you actually get, did the distraction mm -hmm. cause you to forget what number did you, you were Yeah, on? did you lose count? Because even if you get distracted, well, I still have a number in my head. Why won't you trust that number, right? That would be okay then. But if you say, I got distracted and now I, can't, now I really sort of like where I was and my count was lost, that would be uh, a reason to, to have a, a doubt, a normal doubt, right? Thank you. Any other, anybody else's thoughts on this one? It's interesting because that speaks to the subjectivity of this somewhat too, because I would have thought it was not obsessional as well. But do I pick this one also to discuss because like I said, when I posted to Facebook saying, but what is the answer? Because again, my own doubt, I'm like, I want to know the exact right answer. Mm -hmm. There was kind of a mix of thoughts on it. So I think it would be a cause for gathering maybe a little bit more information. Exactly, mentioned. exactly. I think that that's how, where you have to go to find more information here to see what, where there is really a distrust of the census or not, because it's not clear. It's not entirely uh, uh, clear from the example itself, whether or not uh, uh, there was uh, any real evidence or not, you know, for the doubt. Mm -hmm. yeah. This could be like a one-off situation. Um, and they may, this may rarely happen, in which case, uh, is it really impacting in an adverse way their, their daily life? If, on the other hand, they find themselves doing this multiple times during an eight hour workday, and then even after they've counted uh, a second time, they feel like they need to count a third time or fourth well, time, then I think it, it, to me, it, it kind of plays into the whole idea that this is coming from the imagination. That, that's sort of like, that's a very good point. And, and that's sort of like, as soon as you see this repetition happening, right? As soon as there is repetition, then you know it's an obsessional doubt because otherwise it would be resolved, correct? So, uh, and, and that's also part of the dis distinguishing characteristics between normal and abnormal doubt, which is that that bit of normal doubt, the deeper you go into it, the more, the, the more you start doubting, you know? Uh, whereas uh, in normal doubt, you just get the information and that's it. Done. I can add to that. Um, I think it's important to point out how we trust ourselves in our non OCD situations. So, for example, um, are there times that we're distracted when we're washing our hands and we don't have contamination theme and we're still like, we still trust that we washed our hands good enough? So, sometimes seeing it from a theme that isn't our own can kind of help us see the point that we're making here is about trusting what we know in that moment. Exactly. Um, the, the second point I wanted to make too um, was that Fred was saying, you know, maybe f further exploration. So I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about how we can do that without it being compulsive, because I think that a lot of people coming into learning about inference based hearing that we're kind of looking and, and um, explore more with the client. I think a lot of us coming from uh, treating OCD might say, well, that sounds compulsive, or that's, that sounds a little bit like investigating. So maybe we can talk about that too, if you guys are thinking that might be helpful. Ah, this um, is actually the end of the PowerPoint. So I will go ahead and just end that there and then we can stop recording. Oh, discuss. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to let, thank you very much, Amanda, because it was a beautiful presentation, really, really clear and, and it shows such a great understanding of uh, of the model, which I'm amazed by uh, you, but many others, uh, uh, how quickly they sort of get the essence of, of what IBA is about. So, so uh, very good, thank you. Thank you, I'll post that on Facebook later, but now you guys, we can have a conversation. <laughs> I thought it was really, really helpful, Amanda, that you pointed out um, in the, in your presentation that we're not bickering with the content. Like, I think that's such a big, big point here is like, we're really, we're really trying to show the process, the how. And, um, and so that's, you know, for us, we can try to figure, like disprove our clients or say, but it is clean, but that's not really what we're trying to do. We're just showing them the process so that they can arrive at that on their own, discovering it for themselves really. 
I agree. And I've almost had to explain this more to other clinicians than therapists, just because we're very stuck in this, but we're not supposed to challenge thoughts. And I'm like, I get it. I'm not challenging thoughts, <laughs> challenging a thought process, or I'm hoping you notice when you're getting sucked into this. And so I mostly included that for us here as therapists, especially if anybody's brand new to this saying, but you're trying to convince them it's not dirty. No, I'm not convincing them it's not dirty. I'm just asking them if this is in their imagination or not. So yeah, that slide was, <laughs> that was for me and my, for therapists. I, I wanted to say you did a great job. I really think that. And I also uh, had labeled that particular one as non-obsessional based on just the information, because if I'm, if I'm counting jelly beans for my kids and get distracted, I end up recounting them. But I guess that's my own bias. But this is my one of my favorite modules. And one of the things that I've learned through experience is that when I go to present it, before I open up the module, because a lot of times I'll put the actual module on my screen and it says OCD is 100% imaginary. I, I, I don't even, I, I go over with my whiteboard and talk about why OCD is 100% imaginary. And I use lots of examples. So I preface it with not saying it's just in your imagination. You know, I want to make sure I'm not, they don't take me as being dismissive or, you know, we all hear as kids, oh, it's just in your head. And so I, I use an example about how imagination is such an important role in different roles in our lives. Like, like if you're an architect, you really need a lot of a perception to make your building sound and safe. But if you want your building to be beautiful, you got to bring in some imagination versus a horror story writer only has a little bit of perception and a lot of imagination. And, and can, if I can relate it to their own career field, but a lot of times, because in through experience, I've, you know, upset people <laughs> in the beginning saying it's in your mind and just jumping in there. So that's the only thing I wanted to add to that. You did a great job. Thank you. Yes. And I should add, and I, I totally skipped that section. I usually explain like, there is no good or bad with perception or imagination. They are both thought processes that we want, we need. I mean, imagination, this is how we come up with great ideas and great works of mm. you no know, fiction. Or is it, yeah, I always get fiction and nonfiction messed up. So we need imaginations. So yeah, I never want to sound dismissive. Like it's just in your head. You're just making this up. Like I explained, like this is what the imagination is for. It's to really get us sucked in and believing it. Not so helpful when it comes to <laughs> OCD and our anxiety. So thank also you. Also helpful when it comes to science. I mean, you know, it's not just the art. It's the medical arts too, is science. And I think it's important to convey that. So yeah, I think that was really a good point about um, we value both perception and imagination. Yeah, it's about not confusing one with the other, right? So it's not about one is lesser than the other, but, but to make sure uh, that people really, and this is the most important step in IBA, I would say this particular, um, uh, worksheet and exercise sheet which which the person doesn't have to, you don't have to convince them that the that the obsession is 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 not justified or that they give up the obsession entirely but they sort of have to intellectually accept after this that yes there there is actually no direct evidence in it i still believe it still feels real to me but yeah i have to admit if it, it comes from within me it doesn't come from the outside or there's no, no direct evidence, not even inside of me, but there's no direct evidence in the case of repartment obsessions, you know, which is a different thing that is no longer about the senses, but it's more about the inner senses. But uh, they have to sort of accept the idea that there's no evidence uh, uh, in the here and now that justifies it. So where does it come from? Well, it comes from something that um, uh, comes from me in, in, in terms of the information I bring in, but it doesn't come from information that's directly around me because the information around me tells me something different than that you know and once they intellectually accept that then you, then you have something to work with that if they don't intellectually accept it then you got a problem for the rest of the therapy you know so that's why it's very important they have to accept the model go ahead Carl. yeah let me jump in here i i read something interesting this week which is that uh, which is that uh both perception and the imagination both feed into the amygdala perception comes in through the front door the imagination comes in through the back door. But what's important is, is that it feels true because the amygdala can still be activated by, by whether you're coming in the front door or the back door, right? So because it feels true, because I feel anxious, 
all right, that is, that is not inherently information about reality, right? And, and, and that's part of the trick of the lived in experience. Okay, I have I wanted a question. To... Um, so, and I, I posed this to Mike earlier, so, um, cause I was very confused. I was going through the, the quiz so Carl, to your point, if, if we can, if our imagination can create this, this um, internal sensation aspect, right? Like we can't necessarily trust that part. We have to look outside of our sensory inputs. Wait, our <laughs> somatic, I guess, more mm -hmm. um, concerns. So, okay, I'm gonna read the question in the quiz. And it says, Direct evidence always refers to what your physical senses tell you, what you can actually perceive, your real bodily reactions or all of the above. And the real bodily reactions is where I was getting stuck because I feel like I can create a lot of those body reactions out of my BS. Yeah, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I agree with that. We, when we're watching a scary movie, our palms will sweat, our hearts will beat fast, we will have adrenaline coming in. So, so I, I too have, have uh, questions about that last item on the list, right? Because right? That, that is, in fact, a big part of the trick, right? That if, I, that if I feel afraid, there must be danger, right? There's a kind of emotional reasoning there. And, and, and no, what's happened is, is that you've been tricked by your imagination. So there is both sensation as well as affect that can be the result of immersion, of immersion in the imagination. So I'll, I'll defer to Fred here in terms of that question. I was yeah, so excited I, I, to see Fred on so I could ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you too. Yeah, no, I think a lot of, I mean, yes, there's, there's, there's fear and all the emotion that can be taken as evidence that there really is danger. I think what you're referring to in particular is that that uh, the imagination can can sometimes uh, uh, create certain sensations that really seem to be there and therefore uh, there's the justification for the doubt. I think it's important to realize that it starts with a doubt which then generates uh, gets the imagination rolling and so there's an as if character to this to these sensations uh, rather than them being actual sensations that are are come about, and let, let me give an example, because I think that will clarify it. Let's say a person has the doubt, I might be a child molester. You know? That can create certain images and sensations as, as if the, these things actually in, exist inside of them. You may have images of children, of sex, molestation, you know? Of course, when, you, when a person experiences that, that, that's awful, but, but they get these intrusions because of the doubt. Now. Are these sensations or images, do they represent motivated intent? No, it's just, it's just the person is experiencing what it would be like to be a child molester and as if, and that can feel extremely real, uh, but it doesn't mean there is any motivated intent behind it. Yeah, uh, like then that's where the groinal response issue yeah. it's like but yeah, i got but, uh, it. there's no that has nothing to do with motivated intent you know so you have to differentiate between sensations that are more like set in motion by the imagination mm -hmm. uh what does it start with you know rather than a person who actually has motivated intent but, but, but sort of like based on reality and based on something real that exists inside of the person you know okay and, i got you so it really has to be upstream the sensations right. need to be more upstream not right. in relation exactly to exactly the okay exactly yeah and and it is true i mean that's it's part of being in the bubble exactly as you say and it's true that it can be extremely confusing for people with ocd and for therapists you know <laughs> but uh that's why ocd is often so so difficult to resolve as well because the feeling and the reality how real it feels is an important aspect of OCD uh, that makes it difficult to resolve because OCD can generate uh, uh, these feelings as if they are really there. Uh, but it does. But the feelings are not the same. Uh, I would argue they're not the same as uh, as actually uh, being there uh, downstream, as you say, you know, or upstream. Actually, <laughs> it's sometimes we confuse downstream, but upstream is after the doubt, uh, or downstream is after the doubt, right? Upstream is before the doubt. So they're not really there. 
in that sense. They don't start with it, it comes after the doubt. And once you unpack that with a client, you usually can see that, they, but it's still like, it can be a very strong uh, sort of uh, uh, justification for the doubt. It keeps coming back, you know, uh, where they say, I do feel something, you know, and well, yeah, okay, but what in the context you feel? And then again, go, you can give people examples of power of the imagination as well in other situations, you know, where they do the same thing, but they don't obsess about, you know, and they can sort of accept from there that, yeah, maybe this is just generated by my imagination and not something that's really there. You know? uh, and, and we should know that to some extent, I think it should be self-evident that, that, that a person who doubts uh, about being a child molester, obviously, or, or anything else, or pedophile, that that's going to create sexual images, but doesn't mean that these sexual images really mean anything as, as, as don't form evidence for being that person. They just have these images because they're so afraid of being that person, or they're so afraid of, of the thing uh, of, 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 of being a certain type of person, which then generates exactly what they're afraid of. So it all comes down to it's in the imagination, it's not really there, not in that sense. Yeah. Am I explaining that okay? Do you, is that clear, Perry? Yeah. Yeah, I think we've, <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about it off and on throughout like the last few months where, you know, our body sensations can be both the outcome of a doubt, like what follows downstream, but they can also be the prompt for a doubt. So um, that's as, true too, yeah. yeah. As Fred was mentioning that, you know, for me, I find it really helpful to talk to my clients about like, if one of my clients goes and works out today and their muscles hurt tomorrow, they're not making inferences about how the muscle pain, that the, the noisy body could mean something because they trust that I worked out yesterday. I, I like, they know that it's, the outcome of a normal body response. No, it, it, it's like it's, it fits into the context of exercising. It doesn't fit into the context of sudden muscle breakdown or anything like that, you know, whatever it may be, that would be the obsessive fear. And, and that's again the point that real sensations are often taken out of context and put into this obsessional context, uh, which is, you could call it different things, mismatching, category errors, but it's the context that's switching and they take something that is completely harmless in the actual context in the here and now that it, that it is occurring in, into an entirely different context. Uh, and that's that's one of the biggest tricks of the OCD, this the shifting in context from reality into the imagination. It, it, it changes, changes the significance of the information that is there entirely uh, in an unjustified way. Teresa, do you mind repeating, because I'm writing it down because you worded it so well. You said it's either like the outcome of a doubt or blank, and that's as fast as I wrote. Yeah, so our body, our noisy bodies can be the prompt for a doubt, but it can also be the out, like it can be what follows downstream from our doubt, following our primary and secondary inferences. So our primary inference is the doubt. Our secondary inference that we, our arrival at is this is what this, it's the consequence. So that's our secondary um, inference. Thank right. Uh, if it's a prompt. And then we have the body sensations following that. Uh, and, and of course, if, it, if it's like in a prompt, when it's a prompt, that feeling is really there, but then it's taken out of context. But it, and if it happens afterwards, then it's usually a, as part of an as if, uh, uh, as a result of the doubt. And it occurs in the imagination, right? So. Thank you. In both, hey, Teresa. In both, in both cases, they're not relevant to the OCD. They don't justify the doubt. Uh, Teresa, how would you rephrase answer C about your real bodily or responses or whatever the answer is? So that it's not confusing for the, the person, uh, oh, the client. On the, on the quiz? On the quiz, yeah. Well, it says real. So to me, that that implies really happening. That that's like the the body really communicating. That's like us knowing that my my body hurts because I worked out yesterday. Okay. So if uh, if they're if they're confusing that with like a grinnell response, then that's not a real bodily emotion. That's coming from the story that they're telling themselves. That's coming from their primary inference, the doubts. So the, now they're in the doubt sequence. And so 
Yeah, it's really, uh, and it can, it can happen so quick, you know, but when, when clients see it and when we, um, when we really kind of like how Fred was saying, when you kind of piece it apart, you know, you separate it. And even when they start to resolve some of their inferential confusion and, and this obsessional doubt, they're like, whoa, that really, like, I can see how different my noisy body is from my noisy body in the sequence my anxiety that comes from my primary and secondary inference. So as our clients continue to learn more and more about OCD, I think that they are getting more and more successful at seeing how these are very different. Um, these are very different experiences. And I, I do find a lot of success with using, not, not using their, their examples. Like they're able to see this if they're really fixated on, um, like the example I gave about working out, like. Um, I might be working with someone who makes a lot of inferences about being tired and that connected to their health, but they have zero inferences about what if when it comes to their post-workout body being made. How about so, POCD example? Or this is where this is going to come up. The for, groinal. For the groinal response, I think that it, so I, I think that it's great to kind of look at the, they didn't have the thought they want to have sex with kids they had a what if I have the thought I want to have sex with kids. So this is that whole like thought, thought fusion, thought imagination fusion. Thing. Okay. And so they're having, they're not having the thought I want to do this. They're having a doubt. What if I want to do this? And then they have the groinal response. And so um, really kind of separating the imagination from reality in that, even in that, um, in that inference process, I think helps them really see that my groinal response follows from my, inference that I could be someone who wants this. It's not who they are. It's ego dystonic. And then they okay. have a grown response, but it happens so quickly. And, and here's the thing, like- Oh uh, yeah, but the, the grown or I, I, the grow, uh, you're right in general, that can create as if reactions as, as if it's not really there. But in, I think in the case of a grown response, it's just about thinking about sex, you know? It has, has nothing to do with children in itself. It's it just- right it's a problem but it, it, it's it, people have to differentiate that or sometimes even when there, when there is a sexual reaction it's also generated by something else but again has nothing to do with children it, so does it come down to uh, uh to, uh, uh, you know? so does so, it come down to identifying the the the, the, the context of the response in terms of the uh, is, sure, yeah, exactly, is my thoughts yeah. are my thoughts dystonic versus uh sure. syntonic it's, yeah, it's about the context. I want it or not. You're, you're worried about it, and that's where it, that's why why it comes on. And there, there's a sexual content to these thoughts, but it doesn't. Those reactions have no bearing on your attraction towards children. It's 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 people with you know, OCD continuously put themselves in situations where they take things out of context. To the extent when we're talking about this situation with child molestation, I mean they may start masturbating and then testing themselves while thinking about children. So. Well, right. why do they have a groinal response? Because they're touching themselves, not because they think about children, but they, they're going to confuse the two together, you know? So it's about, you have to separate okay. what is what is just a normal reaction or a commonsensical reaction to to what you're doing versus uh, what you're thinking of versus versus this whole thing about, about being worried about being a child molester. It's something different, like thinking, thinking about children. It doesn't justify those type of inferences at all, even if there's a groinal response, right? It's okay. I, and it's the last thing. I don't want to be labor this, but if I if I change that answer to a real bodily response that is aligned with who I am, my real self, or something along my values or whatever, is that uh, taking it too far, or am I just? I'm trying to get I don't it. Know what so, you're, I, I don't understand the question. I, I think what I'm getting at is uh, the response is either uh, the result of a syntonic uh, thought that I they enjoy, they find pleasurable. It's not unwanted versus one that's completely dystonic. And it seems it seems to happen. I'm having this response and uh, even to this unwanted thought. Um, Maybe I'm just making this too complex, but I don't. But I know it's come up with my clients. Paul, I, let me let me jump. I, I, though, what I'm thinking that I would add in there, I think real, I think I think a real sensation gets a little, it gets kind of confusion. How about a reality-based sensation? 
about okay. what I know right yeah. now. Okay, a reality-based sensation, right? And and okay. you know, and 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 I think that and I think that what gets tricky here, and we see it particularly in health anxiety, right? Um, which is which is that um, you know there is extraception, right? Information that we get through the five senses, and then there's interception which is what we're talking about, right? Sensations that come up from the body, which may or may not be information. See, and, and I think that that's where, that's where it gets, it, it, that's where I think we can be particularly vulnerable to getting hijacked by the imagination, right? Right, but, but, but it, I mean, you know, but if, you know, if, you're, if your stomach hurts, right, right, or your heart is beating fast, you know, or there's a sensation in your groin that's real, right? Right, right. But but the meaning that's attributed to that, the story that's involved with that, that's that's the inferential confusion, right? Right. right. Go with that. Yeah, you Thank know, you. And, and, and so for example, it's the difference between a sensation and a symptom, and 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 I know Mike, Mike Hetty, and I are really you know, I've really talked about the importance of making a distinction between those and that, and the patients will often describe any sensation as being a symptom, right? Uh, but there's, but there's a story there, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And sometimes uh, I would not try to overanalyze it either. Sometimes you just have to go back to common sense and it's right away clear. I mean, it's, it's, if, if somebody ha has a groin response in the context of, of, of thinking about sex, no matter what type of sex it is, uh, that, that that makes sense, but it doesn't mean doesn't justify these obsessional inferences that people have. You know, gotcha. Uh, okay. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's it, go back to common sense, and you can cut through it that way with, with your clients. You know, like take a step back now for a second and look at what's going on. You know, like do you really think in any other situation, if this would happen to somebody else, that it would be, would be any justification? Like, would it, would a a teenage 16 year old teenage boy who has, who has a baby on the lap and he gets an erection because of the rubbing would it justify that boy is a child molester, you know? Use common sense, you know, and, and it doesn't, you know, because these are different contexts, you know, then okay. uh, there's, there's no justification for the obsessional doubt in these instances. You know? part, of, part of resolving this inferential confusion is our, our clients trusting themselves more. And what I find really important for us as clinicians is to, to recognize and help our clients see that they actually do trust their, themselves in some parts of their day. Because we, we're, we're showing them that it's very selective to this vulnerable self theme. It's very selective to their OCD symptoms. But um, for example, like if I'm working with a client who's sitting next to a glass window, and that's not their theme, because I do have some clients who are scared of glass, right? Like it could get in their food or, or um, it could be on the floor. But, you know, if they're sitting next to glass and they have no inferences about that glass getting on them right now, they are trusting themselves that th the glass is okay. It's there. Like, so you can find that anywhere for them. But it's going to be somewhere. There's somewhere that they are trusting their common sense, their, their sense of selves, and their reality, what their senses are saying. And we just point it out. And because sometimes our clients are like, I don't know what it's like to live without OCD. Right? They don't know what it's like to live without OCD, but there are parts of the, their day that they live without OCD because they're trusting themselves in certain parts. So I think that that can be really helpful for us to, to show them that. And, we, and we're growing that with them. That's what, where we use the stories, right? Like we start inserting more and more stories and, and that's how we start to resolve some of this mistrust of their senses is by showing them how they already have that, that skill and that practice and that trust in parts of their day. I feel like I got caught up in inferential confusion just by my, my own discussion in some ways. Um, it's good, yeah. right? I mean, that's why, that's why I think common sense can be so helpful for therapists as well. They say, just take a step back for a second and am I, am I overanalyzing this or not? Yeah. Because yeah. that's what people with OCD do, right? And, mm -hmm. and IBA is not about analyzing or overanalyzing and getting caught up in the argument, you know? Uh, it is about, about taking a step back and seeing, well, is there, is, is there really any justification? You can sort of like get really caught up in that. But uh, uh, when you do, then you probably are 
uh, you actually went into the bubble with the patient. So, <laughs> yeah. right. I had a quick question in the last couple of minutes. Um, so uh, me and Ryan, my colleague that's on, we are, um, we had a residential patient um, that now we are like, now that we've learned more about IBT, oh, I just we're like, pause real quick. I think yeah. we're still recording. Are we? I thought it stopped. Oh, okay. So it is. Yeah, I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> 